Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, good afternoon and evening for those of you on the East Coast. We're excited to share our third webinar today, uh, Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute. Um, I know many of you had joined us for our last two with Dr. Adrian Trevis and Dave Parsons, Kim Crumbo. If you missed either of those, um, they are on our website, projectcoyote.org, and also on the Rewilding website. We are recording today, and similar to the last two webinars, um, you're welcome to pose questions through the chat, and then Sarah at the end will take as many as she can. We do have to, unfortunately, keep it to an hour, but any questions that are unanswered, Sarah has uh, kindly offered to address those in writing, so we'll add those to the web page, landing page that we'll be sending out. So I'd just like to, before I introduce Sarah, I'd like to introduce uh, John Davis, who is my co-host with the Rewilding Institute. Um, John, do you want to say any few words? Sure. First and foremost, thank you to Project Coyote, Coyote for pulling together such a, an impressive crowd. Though we can't see you, we know you are numerous and we, we know you love wild cats. I am Executive Director of Rewilding Institute. We have a beautiful online periodical for which Camilla writes occasionally when we are fortunate. It's called Rewilding Earth and it's at rewilding.org. And the Rewilding Institute as well advocates for protection of re and recovery of the full range of native wildlife, including top carnivores, like the ones we're hearing about in these recent webinars. So please, if you have the time, look at Rewilding Earth and give us your thoughts on it. And, and again, thank you so much to Camilla and Sarah and Callie for pulling this together. I personally love bobcats. I live right on the edge of some of the best bobcat habitat in the Adirondacks, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, John. So to introduce Sarah, super excited for Sarah to join us for this. Um, Sarah is a Project Coyote wildlife educator. Um, she works with us, helping us with our Keeping It Wild Youth Education and Outreach Program. Um, she wears many hats. She's a practicing attorney. She's a mother of two. Um, she's an active community volunteer uh, here in Marin County. Um, she's also a certified California naturalist, and she's a fantastic uh, wildlife photographer. You'll obviously today get to see some of her gorgeous photos, but if you haven't checked out her fabulous uh, website, I encourage you to do so. We'll be sending out a link to that. Follow her on Instagram to get wonderful uh, wildlife photographs. And um, today she's going to talk about her deep passion for our wild elusive bobcats and particularly focused on Point Reyes, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard about in the news and she'll be mentioning just where they're at with the fires out there for the poor wildlife. Um, but so with no further ado, given our short time span here, I'm going to introduce and pass it on to Sarah. Great. Thank you so much, Camilla and John, uh, for inviting me to do this. I'm super excited to talk about my absolute favorite animal. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and hopefully this will. OK. <clears throat> so thank you, everyone, for joining us to uh, hear about bobcats. Wilderness and wildlife are a source of solace and refuge for me, and I hope in this next hour you will find yourself inspired and enjoy learning more about these incredible, beautiful cats. So uh, the theme of this talk is really coexistence and uh, humans and bobcats, and then a lot of information about bobcats. So let's see, as we get started. The elusive and charismatic lynx rufus, one of four types of lynx in the world. And as I go through this presentation, um, I have some questions for you to ponder. And this is the first one, which is what do you think of when you think about a bobcat? What words come to mind? And how do you think human choices impact bobcat's survival? We've got a quick quiz, and if you're sitting watching with anyone else, you can take this quiz together. You can tell each other your answers. We'll circle back on these questions at the end. Uh, so true or false, the average bobcat weighs 50 pounds. Bobcats are omnivores. The average California bobcat territory size is 75 square miles. Suburban bobcats prey on domesticated cats and dogs. It's okay to leave out cat food and water for bobcats and rodenticide use doesn't harm bobcats. So we'll come back to those true or false questions later on. Questions during the webinar. 
So as I go along and um, show these photos and video, questions for you to think about are, what do you notice in the images and what do you wonder about in the images and about the animal? Questions for me, as Camilla mentioned, I will take questions and comments at the end of the talk and you can use the chat feature of Zoom. And the questions we don't get to, we'll post written questions and answers on the website later. I do want to note, um, just before I get started, that all of the photos in this presentation were taken by me as well as the video, and I use a very long lens when I'm shooting. So although these images of bobcats appear quite close, I'm always a safe distance away from them. And when I do, in non-COVID times, when I am doing classroom presentations, I actually bring my camera with me so the students can see the size of the lens and understand how far I am. So this is a California bobcat on an afternoon hunt. And um, just take a minute, take a look, notice uh, things about the size, the shape, the coloration. So bobcats are typically 11 to 30 pounds. In California, the males average about 20 pounds and females average 14 pounds. The average lifespan of a bobcat in the wild is seven to 12 years. They have a spotted coat that provides camouflage, really excellent camouflage. They're, I call them Houdinis. They can be very hard to find, even when you know where one has just gone into the bush. Uh, the pattern does vary by animal and can be a way to identify them. Uh, they also vary uh, by region of the United States. And so there are actually 12 subspecies of bobcats, which are based on geographical variation in the bobcats. Their bodies are 26 to 41 inches long, so generally around three feet. <clears throat> and they stand about two feet um, high at the shoulder. They have short or bobbed tails, which is how they get their name, bobcat, bobbed tail. Uh, and the tail is generally four to seven inches long. Sometimes it's even a little shorter, but generally four to seven inches. They have stripes on their forelegs, so on the inside of their front legs, in a distinct pattern that's different for every bobcat. So um, sometimes it's stripes, sometimes it's got dots, combination, and then their back legs are longer than their front legs. They also have black tufts at the tops of their ears. So here's another bobcat. And you might notice that this bobcat compared to the one I showed a moment ago has a much fainter coat. Uh, the spots are much less pronounced on the body, but you can see the striping on the inside of the forelegs see the very little black tufts. The Canada lynx has much bigger tufts on the ears. And then the tail on this one's a little shorter than the tail that was on the other one I just showed. So this photo has a sleeping bobcat in it. So take a minute and see if you can locate where the bobcat is in the bushes here. I'm going to get the marker out and hopefully this will work. So the bobcat is actually right there. And if you didn't know it was there and it wasn't moving, you might never see it if you were walking or driving or bicycling by. Bobcats social distance all the time, not just in pandemic days. They are solitary animals and they're territorial. So a typical male territory is three to five square miles. The male territories will often overlap with two or three females territories and the typical female territory is one to three square miles and they don't usually overlap female territories. The territory size is dependent on the availability of food and so territory can be as large as 70 miles and territory size is something that varies geographically so it's smaller here in California than it is in some other parts of the country. Bobcats mark their territory by scratching um, with urine and with scat. And bobcats often have to cross roads that bisect their territory. So they will cross um, a street or an avenue, but they tend to avoid crossing freeways. So there are some well-documented uh, mountain lions that cross some of the big freeways down in Southern California. Bobcats tend to avoid crossing uh, big freeways and highways. Bobcats prefer grassland or scrub brush and woodland areas, but they've adapted to living in suburban and even urban environments. 
So this is a picture in the Point Reyes National Seashore in, here in Northern California, and it represents sort of typical classic bobcat habitat. It's got some um, brush and some open areas for hunting uh, the small mammals and rodents that their preferred food is here. Historical interactions with bobcats for humans. Um, I was an anthropology major in college, so I find all of this particularly fascinating. Uh, Native Americans featured bobcats and lynx in some of their stories. The bobcat is often paired with the coyote. So the Nez Perce viewed them as opposites in the, they had a belief system of dualism and the bobcat and coyote were opposites. Shawnee legend has it that Bobcat was tricked by a rabbit in a, with a, making a fire and that led to the spots on its fur. There are other tales that talk about how Bobcats got its lean form by being pulled or stretched or how its tail got um, chopped. And the Mojave believed that dreaming of Bobcats would provide superior hunting skills because they're such excellent hunters. There are a number of burial sites for dogs, but there's one burial site of a bobcat from about 2000 years ago. A young bobcat is actually in a Hopewell burial mound with 22 human remains on a bluff near the Illinois River. And interestingly, this bobcat actually was buried wearing a collar of bear teeth and seashells that were positioned, and the cat was positioned with its paws crossed. So it was clearly intentionally buried either as a blessing um, or uh, perhaps possibly being even having been kept as a pet. It was a young bobcat. And then when the Europeans arrived, they saw the large predators like wolves, cougars, coyotes, and bobcats as a threat. Bobcats were seen as demons and vermin, and like many other large predators, were seen as a threat to their lives, to their livestock, and to their game. Many, many states had bounties on bobcats in the 17th and 18th centuries. As the settlers moved west, they drained swamps and cut down forests for agriculture and settlements, dramatically reducing the bobcat habitat. Bobcat populations declined and quite dramatically in some states. Where can we find bobcats today? Bobcats are highly adaptable animals. Their preferred habitat includes partially open areas for hunting prey, as I showed earlier, and they like to have either rocky ledges or logs for den sites. But bobcats are spread throughout the lower 48 states uh, in wilderness areas like national and state parks and other open spaces where you'd expect to find them. And then in urban areas um, where you might not expect to find them, like Dallas, Texas, and even Washington, DC. And in the urban areas, they are using the green belts and green spaces to navigate those um, urban environments. And so there's some really interesting research done um, in Dallas on how the, they've collared some of the cats and tracked how they move through an urban environment using riparian areas and other green spaces and green belts. We also have bobcats in our suburban neighborhoods and depending on where you live, you may have next door, um, uh, which is often the site of local announcements of people spotting bobcats in their driveways or crossing their streets. The local news also often features um, here in the Bay Area when a, bob a bobcat crosses the road in Fremont or um, in other urban or suburban areas, it sometimes makes a little um, a news clip. Kiawa Island in South Carolina is uh, renowned for its bobcat population and they recently have had a significant decline. What was a population they estimated at 30 to 35 bobcats has now dropped down to what they believe is only 10. And I'll come back to that and the reasons why they think that's true. Living in an urban and suburban area, while the bobcats are adaptable to doing that, it appears to also increase their exposure to rodenticides, which has negative consequences for them in the long run. In finding bobcats, it's great if you see the bobcat itself immediately, but when you're looking for one, the other ways to see if there are bobcats in the area are to look for their signs. So tracks, scat, or scratching. And so this image is a picture of um, bobcat tracks in a sort of dusty, dirty trail. And the tracks are right in here. The bobcat tracks are generally about two inches in diameter. 
So there are some ways that bobcats are similar to domestic cats. Their grooming behavior, for example, so in this image you can see the bobcat is licking its front paw. And bobcats wash their face the same way that your pet cat washes its face. They lick their paw and then wipe uh, the sides of their face and their ears and their nose and then switch sides um, at the same, same kind of motions. Bobcats also do what your pet cat probably does when it's concentrating really hard on possibly jumping on something or if it's annoyed, they flick their tail. And bobcats are susceptible to some of the same diseases as domestic cats. It's one of many reasons to keep your domestic cats indoors or if you have an outdoor area for them to make it an enclosure so that they don't transmit any feline diseases to wild cats or other animals. Bobcats and domestic cats both have great hunting skill. They have the retractable claws. So you might have noticed in that bobcat print, there weren't uh, claw tips visible the same way in a canine track. You would have the little dots for the claws at the tops of each pad. Cats have retractable claws and so their prints don't generally show any claw tip. Bobcats also scratch. So uh, at home, you might have a scratching pad or a scratching post for your cat if you have a pet cat and bobcats will use often logs. Um, their scratching area is generally about 18 inches or two feet off the ground and they'll scratch on um, dead wood or a log um, as a way of marking and scratching their claws. They also have similar prey selection um, if you allow your cat outside, which again I would say there are many reasons why it's best not to do that, but um, small mammals, birds, and lizards are prey uh, to both bobcats and domestic cats. Okay, so I'm going to show a video now how well the video plays, whoops, let's see, is going to be a function of um, both your internet speed and my internet speed. So um, hopefully this will play smoothly, but um, if it doesn't, if it's a little choppy, I still think the behavior is hopefully worth seeing even if it doesn't play smoothly. So without further ado, I'm gonna hit play and hopefully this will work. It's just a one minute video clip of a bobcat in a suburban yard. So now you can see the cat washing its face with its paw. Okay, so hopefully that um, played well for you. Okay, so ways to differentiate bobcats from domestic cats. So there are a couple of key physiological features where if you saw a cat and you wondered, is that a bobcat or is that a feral cat? out in the fields. Uh, these are the things, key things to look for. One is the tail length. So um, again, the short, much shorter tail. Another is the white section on the inside of the forelegs that has typically these stripes or spots. There are black tufts on the tips of the ears and these, even in this photo, they're hard to see. They're relatively small tufts, especially as I said, compared to like the Canada lynx has very pronounced tufts at the top of its ears and bobcats have relatively small but little black tufts and then size. So a bobcat is going to be bigger um, typically um, by something like 50% uh, versus the size of a house cat. So maybe not quite twice the size of a house cat but typically bigger than a domestic cat would be. So here's 
uh, cat with a gopher in its mouth. And uh, again, if you're sitting here watching with anyone else, you can turn to them and say, what do you think? Is this a bobcat or a domestic cat? And notwithstanding the slightly um, tawny beige color of it, this is a barn cat. Um, this is actually a cat in a field in the Point Reyes National Seashore, but it's uh, got a gopher. So this is a domestic cat. Bobcats are obligate carnivores, which means they have to eat meat to survive. Their diet varies, however, because bobcats are opportunistic predators and they will eat a variety of animals depending on the habitat and what's available. Most commonly, they eat rabbits, gophers, voles, other small mammals, and occasionally birds and lizards. I've seen a bobcat catch a quail. I've seen photos of a bobcat catching a gull, uh, which was pretty incredible. Um, it's not something I've ever seen in person, but they do uh, go after birds and lizards, but their preference is for small mammals and particularly rabbits, gophers, and voles. In California, in other parts of the US, um, rabbits and hares are the primary prey, and in the Southeast, it's apparently cotton rats. In the eastern states, they also hunt deer, um, particularly fawns. But bobcats provide excellent rodent control and are part of a healthy ecosystem. A recent study of bobcats in Santa Clara County here in uh, Northern California found rodenticides in 100% of the bobcats they tested. And these were bobcats uh, living in an urban area. The studies that have sampled bobcat scat have actually never found any evidence of bobcats eating domestic cats or dogs. So a lot of times when people post either in the news or on Nextdoor and say, oh, they've seen a bobcat, everybody bring your pets inside, worried that a bobcat might eat them. The reality is the bobcat's probably not going to eat them. There's no evidence that they do. Um, a bobcat might in a territorial dispute or in defending kittens attack a cat or a dog, but they don't view them generally as prey. Bobcats will though prey on chickens and lamb and other small, um, small livestock. So this is a bobcat uh, with a gopher and you can see it's holding the gopher basically by the neck. This is also from the Point Reyes National Seashore. Bobcats have an, a few different hunting styles. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to watch bobcats hunting. They are such intense, strong, and patient hunters. It's really, it's a fabulous way to spend uh, an afternoon. If you can have an hour or two sitting with a bobcat hunting, it's really amazing. This bobcat is crouched low and you can't see the gopher hole. It's just to the right of the edge of the image. But this bobcat's going to basically lunge straight across um, across the top of the grass when the gopher pops its head up next. So it's waiting for that perfect moment to strike and grab the gopher um, with sort of a horizontal rush on where the where the gopher is coming up. This bobcat is employing a different hunting technique. It has its front paw ready to, the hole is right in front of where that cat is. And again, for a gopher, uh, another way that they hunt is to try and basically grab the gopher out of the hole. So this bobcat is waiting for the opportunity to scoop and hopefully catch a gopher that way. My favorite way to watch them hunt though is, the, is what I call the leap. Uh, so they are, this bobcat, and you can see the muscle in this beautiful cat, uh, this bobcat is tensed and ready to spring forward. So a bobcat can focus in, in this case, the gopher holes in the left-hand side of the image, focus in on a gopher hole and be poised to spring and leap and just stay motionless without a twitch, waiting for the perfect moment to leap forward. There's a leap um, in tall grass. I think in that case, it was going for a bowl that was in the grass and not a gopher that was underground. Bobcats have vision that is particularly well suited to the times that they're hunting. Bobcats are crepuscular, meaning they're primarily hunting at dawn and dusk. 
but it's actually not unusual to see bobcats hunting during the day. And you probably noticed those photos that I just showed of bobcats hunting for the most part look like daytime shots. Some of them were late afternoon, but they're during the day. And particularly they will hunt during the day if they're in a wilderness area where there aren't a lot of people or when they're feeding kittens. Bobcats have excellent hearing and vision. So bobcats have six to eight times the number of rod cells in their retinas versus humans, which enables them to see better in the dark. So cone cells see color and function best in bright light and rod cells activate in low light and create black and white images. I think of them as sort of like night vision goggles. And so bobcats have six to eight times the number of rod cells that we do, which enables them to see much better in low light. Bobcats are also just incredibly sensitive to their surroundings and between their hearing and their vision, they usually are aware of us very, very, very well in advance of when we might spot the bobcat. And they tend to be wary of humans, uh, so they typically will hide, uh, which they're very good at, and just either duck down flat in the grass or duck into some tall brush. And if you didn't see them go in there, you probably won't see that they're there if you went by. If they're feeling particularly threatened or someone's very close to them, they will run, but their first defense is to flatten down and hide, uh, make themselves invisible, which they do a surprisingly good job of. And bobcats' wariness of humans, I think, is one of the reasons that they're uh, not nearly as well studied as some of the other predators in North America. This is a bobcat with a gopher in its mouth, and typically bobcats will consume their prey very quickly, in part to avoid losing it to another animal. So a bobcat might hunt and kill a gopher or a bull or a rabbit and just sit down and eat it right where they've killed it. Sometimes, as this cat did, they'll kill it in open grass and then stand up and walk over. It's going straight to the brush that's toward the back of the image and find a spot under a little bit of cover at the edge of the brush. Um, but it's amazing how quickly they will eat uh, a gopher. It doesn't take very long at all. I mean, just a minute or two and the whole thing is gone. So um, coyotes and other animals will try and take a gopher if they have the opportunity or a bowl if the bobcat is out in the open. So they usually find a protected spot to eat. This is a bobcat mother carrying a vole back to her babies. So that's one exception um, to see a cat traveling a distance that's longer from an open area to a safer, more protected area is if they're carrying it back to feed their young. And um, I'll get to kittens in a minute, but the mothers are the ones that feed the babies. Uh, this is a bobcat with a cottontail rabbit. And in this case, you can see it killed it right under the edge of this um, coyote bush that's behind it. And in this instance, the cat just dropped down and ate it right there because it was already in a relatively protected spot when it killed it. A few other just fun bobcat statistics because I love all things bobcat. Uh, they are present in all of the contiguous 48 states. Recently only have they been present again in Delaware. So a lot of the stuff you read will say they're in all the states except Delaware, but um, there are some recent reports that there are in fact some bobcats in Delaware. The population is really difficult to estimate because bobcats are elusive and they're relatively rarely studied. The most recent estimate that I've been able to find from 2010 says that there are 2.4 to 3.5 million in total. And that uh, is a big increase from the prior estimates that put the total at somewhere between 750,000 and a million. And that was at least 10 years prior to this count. I think from the mid nineties was the earlier count. And they're doing that by estimating how many square miles there are and how many square miles are in a bobcat's territory and how many are seen. And so it's, it's pretty, um, it's a pretty rough estimate, but there, there is a study that tried to come up with a nationwide total. And they do live from almost basically the northern edge of the US um, edge where they meet with the Canada lynx down into Mexico. The Canada lynx has an advantage uh, in the snow over bobcats because they have larger paws and their paws are furrier and they're better adapted to walking in snow. So typically the Canada lynx has an advantage and um, will um, 
be the preferred species over bobcats in places where there's a lot of snow if there's an overlap. Bobcats eat two to three pounds of meat per day. It's an estimate. They can go for a, a, quite a while without eating meat, um, without eating if they had to, but generally they would try and eat two to three pounds of meat a day. They can run 25 or 30 miles an hour in a short sprint. So uh, they spend a lot of their time when they're hunting quite motionless or slowly creeping, but they can run very quickly um, for a short distance. Bobcats are also really good swimmers. There are a variety of YouTube videos out there of cats, um, including some of cats swimming, and they are good swimmers, even though people say cats don't like water. The wild cats are all actually good swimmers. A bobcat can jump as high as 10 feet and as far across as 12 feet. So again, there's a great video of a bobcat jumping over a body of water that you think it can't possibly make it across, and it does. Bobcats kill uh, their prey with a bite to the, usually the back of the neck or the skull or the throat. So sort of in the position that some of the images that I've shown where the bobcat is carrying the prey, it's the same spot that would be the kill spot. Bobcats are still currently endangered in New Jersey. They were previously listed as endangered in Ohio and Indiana, as well as the Mexican subspecies was also listed as endangered and they were considered threatened in Illinois and Iowa. And again, that is in part a remnant of the um, colonial, um, the westward expansion where both habitat was destroyed and bobcats and other predators were targeted to be killed. So this is an image of a bobcat hunting at sunset and you can see the color of its coat and the spots on the coat, how easily if it chose to duck back into the middle of the grass uh, that it would camouflage and disappear completely. This is perhaps my favorite part of the talk, bobcat kittens. So the bobcat life cycle, bobcats a female typically will have one litter per year of two to four kittens, most commonly, and the kittens are born in late spring. And again, there's a little bit of geographic variation um, depending on altitude and climate and temperature, but generally late spring. The mothers raise their kittens alone. And until the kittens are old enough to go out and learn to hunt, they will stay in the den while the mother goes out to hunt. Bobcats do generally have multiple den sites within their territory, and so um, during the day they may go to a different den site, or if a mother has kittens, she may move her kittens after a period of weeks to a different den site and then move them again. This is a mother bobcat grooming her young bobcat kitten. Probably, I would estimate it at um, about five or six weeks old. You can see that kitten still has blue eyes. Bobcat kittens are born blind and with their eyes closed, their eyes open after about a week. They're weaned at two months, but will stay with their mothers for at least six months and will start learning to hunt at roughly three to five months. So they'll first they'll be weaned and their mother will start bringing back prey for them to eat. And then she will begin teaching them to hunt. And they typically disperse at eight to 12 months. And again, there's some geographic regional variation in the age and timing of their dispersal. Here's another picture of a five to seven week old bobcat kitten. And this you can see is a slightly older, it's two to three months old. Um, so it's starting to venture out and um, looking at prey and thinking about hunting, but probably not successfully hunting on its own just yet. This bobcat mother hunted and then um, she killed the gopher and dropped it to the kit. This kitten was one of three in the litter. Um, kitten came running over, grabbed it, and then ran off with it and there were two siblings in the brush and there was a lot of growling and meowing and skirmishing over the kill once this one kitten went back with it. This bobcat kitten actually pulled this gopher out itself, uh, but it was pulled out of a hole and when it came out, it was already dead. 
and I'll talk more about it, but it either had been injured in an attack by another um, animal, so a great blue heron or something else could have attempted to kill the gopher but not been able to get it out of the hole, or the gopher could have been poisoned um, with rodenticides and been dead from that when the kitten pulled it out and took it off to eat. So here's a bobcat in a full sprint being startled, had been startled by a, a loud noise from a car. You can see the long lean body. And uh, this image of a bobcat running away is my introduction to the different threats that we have currently to bobcats. So what kills a bobcat? Mountain lions will kill a bobcat. Packs of coyotes will kill a bobcat. Kittens may be killed by foxes, coyotes, owls, eagles, or even rarely by adult male bobcats. And so mothers will defend their kittens. Um, if a male bobcat comes near her den when she has young kittens, she will um, chase off the male. The biggest danger by far to bobcats, however, is humans. So hunting, trapping, and wildlife killing contests are all um, ways that humans currently, um, unfortunately, kill bobcats in the United States. So trophy hunting of bobcats was banned in California at the end of 2019, but it is legal in 40 states. Bobcat trapping was banned in California in 2015, but it's legal in most states. And bobcats are trapped for their fur. Their pelts can sell for upwards of $1,000 and are typically exported to China and Russia. So in the 70s, when there were laws passed that protected the fur and protected big cats, um, the demand for bobcat fur went up significantly and the price of a bobcat, or the value of the bobcat pelt went up. And so unfortunately they became more targeted as other large cats became protected. Wildlife killing contests give prizes for people killing the most or the biggest fur-bearing non-game animals. So that's things like coyotes, foxes, and bobcats. Wildlife killing contests were banned in California in 2014, and Project Coyote is part of a nationwide coalition to outlaw these contests in every state. Unfortunately, wildlife killing contests are currently legal in 44 states. They're outlawed in California, Massachusetts, Arizona, Vermont, New Mexico, and Colorado. And I understand that uh, Washington is currently or soon to be considering a ban as well. So how do we in our human decisions impact bobcats? other than hunting and trapping and killing contests. And there are a number of things in our day-to-day -day life that impact bobcat survival. Rodenticide use is a huge one and bobcats are exposed in utero through their adulthood. So when a bobcat mother is pregnant and she eats a rodent that has second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, that poison is being passed not only into her system, but into the kitten system as well. Development is another way that we continue to impact bobcats. So we have traffic fatalities and genetic bottlenecking as populations become isolated. So when bobcats are unable or unwilling to cross large roadways, their genetic mix and the bobcats that they're able to reproduce with become smaller and so you end up with isolated groups with very closely related genetics which isn't good in the long term. We also people sometimes have a misplaced fear and mistake a bobcat for a mountain lion and an East Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area, an East Bay park manager in an interview said that when they investigated reports of mountain lions, 30, 40, 30 to 40% of the time, they found that actually what was being reported was a bobcat. So people mistakenly fear them and think that they're mountain lions. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, bobcats are uh, adorable, beautiful animals, and people sometimes think that they're more akin to pets. And so be, the bobcats can become habituated to humans when people leave out food or water. Sometimes people even try and take kittens in as pets, um, which is obviously um, not going to work out. Generally, it, it goes predictably badly and they end up re-releasing the animals. 
into the wild, but at that point they've become acclimated and um, can't survive on their own. Mange is another uh, thing that actually not only impacts bobcats, but in Southern California, there was a period of time where they had a number of bobcat deaths related to mange. And it's a mite that causes itching for loss and death. And it was originally introduced by humans in the early 1900s to kill wolves and coyotes. Other diseases that humans and our choices can um, help transmit to bobcats. Bobcats are susceptible to some of the same diseases and parasites as domestic cats and can contract them from pets. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have a pet cat and you let it outside, some of the diseases that it gets um, can be passed on to wild cats and foxes and other animals. So this is a bobcat in a suburban neighborhood preparing to cross the street. And it always pauses at the curbside. So it, it knows about the danger of cars, but especially if a car is speeding, um, a bobcat may not be able to get out of the way in time. As I mentioned a minute ago, people often think that bobcats are cute and want to feed them, have them come back to the neighborhood or their yard or um, see them on a trailhead uh, consistently. And Project Coyote has a saying that a fed coyote is a dead coyote. I've adapted that slightly to say a fed bobcat is a dead bobcat because although bobcats are cute, they really um, can't survive in the wild if they become habituated to uh, human contact and being fed by humans. And in fact, in Marin County, we had a really sad story about a bobcat that um, had been clawing at and sort of nipping at hikers, which is basically unheard of. Bobcats don't attack people generally at all. And but this bobcat had approached two different groups of hikers. And then when they started investigating, it turned out that this bobcat was on a trail and the neighbors near the trailhead had, when it was a kitten, had started feeding it. And so what happened to this poor bobcat is it lost its ability to hunt and it became habituated to humans and viewed them as a source of food. And because it had nipped at some, although it was first kept for monitoring, ultimately they decided they needed to know whether it had rabies or not, which meant it had to be euthanized. So these neighbors in wanting to feed and keep the bobcat around ended up doing something that caused the bobcat to be killed. Sometimes the bobcats that people take in or think they could take in as a pet that doesn't work out end up when they re-release them being caught um, and brought to wildlife rescue organizations where they can be kept as um, ambassador animals, but they're being deprived of a life in the wild. And so um, feeding a wild animal is um, usually a path towards its eventual demise. And sometimes they starve to death and sometimes they end up being euthanized. So I mentioned rodenticides are a huge issue for bobcats and other predators. And this is a picture of a uh, gopher on a trail that um, I don't know how it was killed. It, doesn't ha it didn't have any visible wounds and it was very close to a creek. Rodenticides, part of what happens is my understanding when an animal has been poisoned by the anticoagulant rodenticides, they become very thirsty. And so it's common for them to seek out sources of water. So this, may or may not have been killed by rodenticides, but I suspect it was. Rodenticide use has a variety of impacts on bobcats. There's the immediate impact, which can cause a bobcat to bleed to death internally, although felines do seem to suffer this fate less frequently than other predators who consume poisoned play, prey. Excuse me. They don't usually bleed to death internally. Uh, there was just a press release today, though, from the National Park Service down in Southern California. They had both a bobcat and a mountain lion um, have internal bleeding and die from um, rodenticide poisoning. So it does happen. It's just a less common impact on cats. But long-term repeated exposure to rodenticides causes changes in a bobcat's immune system. So there's some really great studies out there that have looked at different markers in the blood and the cells and find that lifetime exposure to rodenticides causes increased inflammation and a decreased immune response, making them susceptible to diseases and also to mange. 
There's also an impact of rodenticides on the liver and the kidneys, although that's been less studied. Um, the studies that are, have been done suggest that there's an impaired functioning, that some of the measurements for those functions are, um, are off from where they should be. In many studies um, where they do test bobcats, for rodenticide exposure, anywhere from 60 to 100% of the bobcats sampled have been exposed to rodenticides. And there's different ways that they test for it. The testing for recent exposure can create a false negative because if the bobcat hasn't immediately preceding that eaten a poisoned um, rodent or mammal, it can show up as if it's a negative test, but then if they do a deeper, different testing on the blood, they can see that they have over their lifetime consumed rodenticides. It's just it wasn't in the period immediately preceding the other test. So this is a bobcat with a gopher on a golf course. Again, you can see the grip on the um, head, the back of the neck. And this is a bobcat kitten walking in open space near homes. So the ways we can help bobcats are to limit development when possible, to create wildlife crossings in busy areas, to protect natural habitats because the bobcats use green belts to traverse urban areas, to protect our environment. And um, it's not on my slides, but I have to say climate change and particularly right now with what's going on in Point Reyes, we have wildfires uh, actually all across California and the US if you look at the fire um, fire service maps, um, excuse me, the forest service maps, the uh, fires are burning just all across the state. Be responsible pet and livestock owners. Don't use rodenticides and don't hire companies that use rodenticides and support. Um, so California currently has a ban pending for uh, rodenticides. So it's AB 1788, Project Coyote is working really hard to see that pass. Uh, but support that bill and similar legislation in your state to ban rodenticide use. It's terrible, not just for bobcats, but for all sorts of predators and raptors. Don't feed or approach wildlife. The best way to observe or photograph wildlife is to sit back, to be quiet and still, and advocate and teach others about what you know. Okay, so we're getting to the end here. I know we're getting short on time. The quick quiz, the true or false, so you can check where you landed. The average bobcat weighs 50 pounds. That's false. Um, they weigh far less than that, probably 14 to 20, generally. Um, bobcats are omnivores. That's also false. They are obligate carnivores. The average California bobcat territory size is not 75 square miles. It's much smaller. It's anywhere from two to five, depending on whether it's a male or a female. Suburban bobcats do not prey on domesticated cats and dogs, so that one's false. It is, as I mentioned, not okay to leave out cat food or water for bobcats, so also false. And rodenticide use does in fact harm bobcats in a number of different ways, so that one is also false. And that is the end. Um, thank you very much. I have a last slide that has some of the articles and studies I've mentioned. Um, so that will be up on the site, but I'll leave you with the uh, bobcat image. And then Camilla and John, I don't know if we have questions. Obviously we have some time for them. And I can stop my screen share if you want, or I can leave it up, whichever you prefer. Uh, either way is fine. Um, and we do have several questions that have come in. So why don't we just pounce into it? Um, I'm going to start with a question from Bob. He asks, <clears throat> is it possible with more study that we might find that bobcats have a better social life than we believe as we are learning about mountain lions? I, I suppose it, anything's possible in the sense of observation. Um, they they do seem to be, I mean, my own, this is based simply on my own personal observations. They do seem to be quite solitary animals um, with the exception of mothers with their kittens or siblings. Um, when they're very young, sometimes the siblings will stick together. But, um, but who knows? I mean, they're hard to study. They're very elusive. So maybe they have secret gatherings in the brush that we're not party to. Yeah, and I will share too that we, we know that there are not that many studies going on right now in the US on bobcats. Um, unlike mountain lions, they haven't been studied as much. Um, there is an ongoing study, Sarah mentioned the uh, um, news release that came out today about the exposure um, and death of the mountain lion and the 
Bobcat in uh, Southern California that was with Seth Riley and others who are with the National Park Service. So they are currently studying mountain lions and bobcats down there and we're expecting to see more peer reviewed studies coming out of their um, long term yep. data. And some of their studies are referenced in that last slide that I have of the research they've done so far on bobcats because they've really done the most extensive research out there. Yeah. John, do you want to pose a question here? Sure, I'll combine two excellent questions that came in. Do, do bobcats, so far as is known, ever interbreed with Canada lynx, which I assume would happen in the northern part of the range if it happens, or with domestic cats? It's a really interesting question. I am not aware of that. I'm certainly not aware of breeding with domestic cats. I did read that a domestic cat would raise bobcat kittens if they were orphaned, uh, which I thought was sort of fascinating. It's actually, whether it's advisable or not, it is legal, um, it is permissible in many states to keep bobcats as pets. So um, they may be getting raised by felines, but I'm not aware of any breeding. And um, I, from my research, I don't think the lynx and the bobcats get along particularly well. So I'm, I'm I'm not aware of any interbreeding there, although certainly possible. Okay, um, Donna asks, what purpose does the white and black behind the ears serve? Oh, that's really interesting, great question. Um, so it does, if you look at the back, it gives the appearance almost of eyes on the back of the head. So that would be my, um, my guesstimate on the evolutionary benefit of having the black and white markings on the back of the ears. Eyes on the back of the head. Jackie asks a question I suspect many of us have wondered, do bobcats ever get COVID, COVID-19? <laughs> uh, I'm not aware of that, but um, based on the news earlier this year from some other captive animals, it seems possible, uh, but I haven't heard of it. And how about do bobcats only exist in North America? And then this uh, same person asked, can you recommend any books about bobcats, which I'm sure will be on your list of things that we send out as a follow-up. Yeah. Um, so um, bobcats are one of four types of lynx in the world. They're lynx rufus and their range is only in North America. There's a Canadian lynx or a Canada lynx um, that goes basically from Alaska to the northern border of the contiguous 48 US states. There's a Eurasian lynx and an Iberian lynx. And actually, I was reading that they surmised that the bobcat actually came across the Bering Strait when the land was solid um, from the Eurasian lynx came down earlier and then later the Canada lynx came across. So they actually are two separate um, migrations, if you will. Um, but bobcats are only in North America. And then the books. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I, I do have some and I'd be happy. It's probably something easier for me to put in written responses in one way or another. Um, but there actually aren't that many. Um, bobcats are kind of a little bit left off as beautiful and amazing as they are. They're not as well studied or well documented, but there are a few really good books about them. Again, combining a few questions, if I may, Sarah, several folks have wondered about if you could say more about rodenticides and how we might discourage their use and how we might find out where it's being used and try to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an issue that I know Project Coyote has been working on tirelessly for a long time. And um, Raptors Are the Solutions uh, Solution is another organization that works on that issue. Um, and I think both organizations have all sorts of suggestions for advocacy, but um, my one of my slides listed some of the ingredients. So the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. In California, as an individual, you can't actually buy them, but pest companies right now can still use them. And so, um, it, you know, our choices include what we ourselves apply, but also who we hire and what methods they use. Um, and so, making sure that you're hiring somebody whose version of um, pest management doesn't include application of any of those chemicals. And then um, reaching out and advocating for, you know, whether it's 
local park systems, local government. Rodenticide use is generally governed by state law, so it's difficult. In fact, Kiawa Islands, I forgot to come back to that. So they believe that their population has been reduced by two thirds due to habitat loss and rodenticide use. And they wanted to ban it on the island and were told that legally it had to be a statewide, that the state itself had to make that rule and that they on the island couldn't ban them. So they were working on a voluntary pledge to try and get all the homeowners and all the merchants on the island to sign an agreement that they wouldn't use them. But um, it's really, it's a statewide issue. And so advocating in your local government and uh, working with some of the amazing nonprofits that are working on this issue, it's a huge issue, not just for bobcats, but for, like I said, all sorts of predators and amazing raptors that are getting um, secondary poisoning and lifetime implications from these, these poisons. And let me mention, just to follow up on that, um, uh, Sarah had mentioned a current bill in the California legislature, that's AB 1788. And I know many of you are already on our E-Team, Project Coyote's E-Team, but if you're not, you can sign up on our website and get our action alerts about this bill. We are hopeful, as Sarah mentioned, that California will become the first state in the nation to ban rodenticides. Um, and more and more studies, every time they're studied uh, by California Department of Fish and Game, National Park Service, we are finding that almost every animal that is tested for exposure is, is demonstrating exposure, whether it's brodificum, dipassinone, all these deadly poisons. So really encourage folks to get involved, help us pass this bill. Um, we are hopeful that we will get it through this legislative session. Um, and along those notes, I also just wanna mention, she had mentioned uh, RATS, which is Raptors Are the Solution. Wonderful um, organization, I'm on their advisory board and they have a whole plethora of information on their website also about alternatives to rodenticides. And there was actually a question here about um, what can be shared through next door about alternatives to rodenticides. So I encourage you to check out RATS website and our website um, for inf inf more information on that. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Do you wanna pose another, John? Sure, uh, Jack, take is, Jack is raising his hand. <laughs> Am I allowed to have a question? <laughs> Hi, Jack. I, really quickly, I just want to say, uh, I, I just want to ask and kind of appreciate your photography. Um, and I imagine one of the reasons that there's not a lot of work done on bobcats is that they are really, really hard to study. How hard are they to photograph? Like what went into this photograph we're looking at? How many hours of waiting or stalking would you have to do to get an image like this? Uh, thank you. And it, I, it's a good thing I don't keep count. Um, I, I would say that it takes many, many, many hours of uh, patience and persistence. Uh, this particular bobcat is one that I've had the fortune to sit with in a field for hours, um, but I've spent a long time knowing where generally to go and then uh, what I call practicing the art of being invisible, which is um, a skill that as a wildlife photographer, if you want to get images, even with a large lens, if you want images of an animal that's relaxed and engaging in its typical behavior, you, you basically, as I say, I like to be as interesting as a rock. I wanna just be another blob in the field, quiet, low, uninteresting, and just have it go about its business. So. I am confident I have spent hundreds of hours uh, looking for, waiting for, watching, and sitting like a rock in a field uh, to get these bobcat photos. And I'll share too that Sarah actually came into Project Coyote Spheres through Daniel Dietrich, who is a Project Coyote ambassador. Um, Daniel runs a company called Point Reyes Safari, and he probably has the best record in the nation for being able to show people bobcats in the wild. Specifically, he takes people out to Point Reyes, and I can't remember what his, his estimate of his um, percentage of times that he's able to show people, but it's upwards of 75 to 85 percent, I believe, uh, for being able to, to show you a wild bobcat. And he doesn't use bait, doesn't use anything. He's um, part of the uh, Ethical Wildlife Photographers National Group. So, um, it's a fabulous experience. Sarah and I have been out there with him, and it's, um, it's phenomenal. Yeah, and Camilla, I'm actually glad you mentioned that. I should say, I didn't at the beginning, um, that none of, their, I don't use calls or bait or anything else for any of my photography. Um, 
uh, Daniel is a member of the NAMPA Ethics Committee, and actually I just joined the Ethics Committee as well, and so feel really strongly about the way in which we take photos of beautiful animals like this. Thank you, Sarah, and I think we are just out of time, but um, thank you all. Thank you, John and Jack and our co-hosts. Uh, we are going to do another webinar probably next month with Joanna Lambert, who will be talking about coexisting with predators. So I encourage you all to tune in and um, share this as well. We, I think we had over 500 registrants this time around and continue to increase. So really pleased to be able to offer it and please share. Um, we'll be sending out the recording and additional information over the next few days. And thank you all. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, right, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Right. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>